everybody welcome 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 just to let you know if i'm smiling awkward it's because my face is frozen but welcome to church it's so great to have you online my name is ade doe and i have graham here with me hi funny it's his first time <laughs> in front of the camera he's always behind the camera how do you feel uh, well yeah this wasn't plan a but you know <laughs> i brushed my hair and everything ready to go <laughs> so Great, we have the sun, so I think my face should be better. Anyway, if you're watching us from YouTube or Facebook, welcome. But just to let you know that we also have our online platform, our website, where you can interact live with someone and request for prayers. So we will highly recommend or encourage you to do so. Um, before I hand over, before we hand over to the worship team, I'd like to find out if Graham would like to pray for us today. Yeah. Absolutely. Why don't you close your eyes? Yep. Let's just take a moment to try and settle our hearts just as we come into God's presence. Father, we want to thank you that wherever we're connecting this morning, this afternoon, whenever we're listening to this message, that you are present. Jesus, we meet in your name, and albeit we're meeting virtually, mm. uh, we meet in the name of Jesus, and we therefore claim the promise that you are with us. Mm. God, I pray for ever, whoever's connecting, wherever they're connecting, Lord, that this moment would be significant for them, I pray, God, that you'd reach out, that they would feel and know your presence. God, and indeed, it would be a transformational time where lives are changed, hearts are formed and shaped according to how you want them to be. God, if there's any discouragement in any place where this message is, is heard, God, I pray you would encourage and bring life. Yeah. God, we, as we come to a moment of worship, we choose to accept that you are king and we choose to worship you as king. So God, get glory through this service today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was very beautiful, Graham. Thank you so much. So we're going to worship now. And if I didn't mention, but actually by Arthur's seat, it's a very beautiful view, but I'd like to encourage us further by opening our hearts, meditate on the words of the song, and let us sing together as a body of Christ. Over to you, worship team. All right, so I'm going to teach this to you. So let's go. So. So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you When I feel I lead at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Did you get that? All right, so we try that one more time. Let me just hear you sing, okay? One, two, three. So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing to the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you That's beautiful, right? Let's go. I see is the battle you see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see the mountains move and as I walk through the shadows your love surrounds There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on, you know this. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. With every fear I lay at your feet. Jesus. 
Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. Come on, we're going to lift our voice and say, You know this one, this is a hymn. Put your hand together. Can it sing, be that?
Thank you so much worship team it's always so beautiful worshiping together i enjoyed that and i hope you did well we have a couple of pretty good announcements to share with you guys i'm pretty excited for the church so basically last week we learned that we are now a registered charity Woo! no dance oh i have a dance <laughs> <laughs> you dance Oh, yeah, we are now a finally registered charity and we're so grateful to God for this opportunity to do this. Um, a couple of other things, Pastor Pete mentioned to us last week, if you haven't heard the plans and the vision of the church. So if you'd like to catch up on that information, please visit our YouTube or our podcast after the service to hear more about this information. One more thing happened as well last week. A lot of good things really happened last yeah. week. Something special happened in the church. Graham, would you like to tell us what it was? Yeah, so last week we took some time in the in-person service in Central to pray yes. for some very significant people. Uh, we have introduced a handful of new elders into the church and eldership couples. And also we are introducing some new trustees that go alongside our new and registered charity. So very exciting moment. I've got my phone here because it's a, it's a list of people who I probably won't remember if I'm doing it off the top of my head. <laughs> Uh, but we are welcoming these, the following couples into eldership. Eldership is a role that's involved in pastoring and, shep, she, pastoring and shepherding God's people. So mm -hmm. these are the names of the wonderful couples that we are inviting into eldership. Niven and Lucy Bull, Dan and Emily Everett, Michael and Lizette Fordhide, Paul and Mandy Graham, Emperor and Matilda Hatsey, Isaiah, and Moo Obe, just amazing people that we love and recognize God's call on their life. And we are so, I'm so excited to have the eldership team broaden with these amazing people. Also, because we're now a registered charity, we need to have trustees. These are people who are responsible to ensure that City on a Hill as a registered charity is above board, legal, doing the right things with the right policies, procedures, and keeping us safe and on track. And we have some, again, very special people, uh, very qualified people who are stepping into this role. We have, of course, Peter Anderson, our lead pastor, uh, Regina Adamako, mm. Steve Tiger, Niven Bull, Isaiah Obey, and Anne Crawford. Uh, and I know all of these people personally, and the eldership team know them. They're great, qualified people who are heads screwed on, full of wisdom, and we know that they're going to be instrumental in taking City on Hell forward for the next important season. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. So I'd like to encourage every one of us to please pray over these people's lives as they take on this new role, that God will guide them and God will give them the vision and the understanding on how to run the body of Christ. So now I'm going to hand over to Pastor Pete. So I'd say, enjoy guys. Enjoy. 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 <laughs> well, hello, welcome to Church Online. 
My name is Pete, a uh, pastor here at City on the Hill, and it's a joy to welcome you to our church online experience. So those who are regulars, love you, love having you part of the church. And for those who this is a new experience, so great that you're connecting. And I pray that you will get something so significant out of this time as we turn to the Bible. Well, we're starting a new series today, uh, which we've entitled Rebuilding with Hope. And uh, Rebuilding with Hope is based on two of the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. Haggai and Zechariah and these are prophets who are speaking words from God of encouragement to people while they're rebuilding and it's really really apt we're going to be looking at this ancient world where prophets were prophesying but actually it completely relates to the current life we live in the world we're living in just now there's a parallel between the ancient world and them rebuilding and here's us here in 2022 rebuilding, rebuilding our lives, rebuilding church, rebuilding our futures, and nevertheless, the encouragements come to speak to us at this time. So uh, let's commit this time uh, in prayer and ask that God will speak to us. Father, thank you so much that you're with us. Wherever we're gathering, thank you, you are with us. And I pray that just now as we go into this new series that these words of encouragement from Haggai and Zechariah over the next few weeks will be words of encouragement, not just to people in the ancient world, but to us in the modern world who are currently rebuilding with hope. So speak to us, we pray. Encourage our hearts, touch our lives. And for anyone who doesn't yet know you, Lord, I pray you'd reveal yourself in a very profound way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me start with a story. A guy rushes to his local police station to report that his wife has gone missing and, and he meets the reporter at the reception and uh, the, the, the officer and the, the officer said, okay, let me get some details and he gets his notepad out. So he said, tell me what happened. And the man said, well, my wife's been missing. Uh, she went shopping last night and yesterday evening and she hasn't returned. So the officer writes down the details and said, okay, can you tell me how old was she? And the guy said, uh, okay, I, th I think she was 54. <laughs> you know, 55 or maybe 56. We don't, we're not really into birthdays. The guy said, okay, that's fine, right? He puts a vague number down. And then he says to the husband, uh, and, and what was her height? And he says, okay, she'll uh, definitely taller than five foot, kind of like that. And the, the officer writes it down. And, and he said, okay, so and roughly what was her weight? I said, well, pff, I don't know. I mean, she wasn't slim, but I mean, she wasn't fat either. So you know and the guy said okay well I'll, I'll write that down and the officer's writing down the details and he said okay sir and can you tell me the color of her eyes <laughs> the guy said okay well i think she i think she was i think it was brown brown eyes and and what about her color of her hair <laughs> she, the guy said well she changes it a few times a year so as far as i can remember it was dark brown you know latterly i think it was dark brown and uh, and what was she wearing uh, and the guy said, okay, probably jeans and a top. And the guy said, okay, so she, you, she, what, what, was she driving a car? And the guy said, yes, it was my 4x4. Four four. I said, well, can you tell me about the 4x4? Four four? And he said, yeah, absolutely. It was a Land Rover Defender 90, short wheelbase. It was a year 2000 special edition competition model. It had heated seats. It had those uh, kind of tan leather Ricardo wing back seats. Uh, and had a Bose sound, surround sound system with subwoofers uh, at the back fantastic car uh, it had raised suspension and uh, all-terrain tires it had a brand new miltec exhaust system on it and the, by this point the guy was choking up and the officer said sir sir don't worry don't worry we, we, will, we will recover your car we will recover your car <laughs> you know sometimes we can get our priorities we can be so completely off track when it comes to our priorities we can be focusing in on completely the wrong things. If you want a title for today's message, my title is First Things First. And this is, and I'm going to get, read you a verse, uh, and this is kind of the punchline verse. I'm going to read it to you from Haggai chapter 1, and then I'm going to zoom out and put it in its context so you understand what's been going on leading up to this point. Haggai chapter 1, and this is verse 4. Is it time, this is God speaking to the people, is it time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin. God's speaking to the people. He's challenging them. Is it time for 
you to live in your panelled houses while this house, the house of God, remains a ruin. So what's the mega story? What's going on here? What's the context into which the prophet's speaking? Well, the kind of the journey so far. The people of Israel, God's special people on earth, a people from among the peoples that God has selected to be his own people, to walk with him. And he brings them and leads them into this place, which the Bible refers to as the promised lands. And while they were in the lands, what we see is they went through a series of rebellions. They, there was times where they were walking on track and then when they would rebel, where they were on track and then they would rebel. And God sent judges and prophets to warn them and to bring them on track. And eventually the warnings come very, very strongly that if you continue in rebellion, you will eventually be taken into exile. And that's, that, was, that was the strong word from God, that you will be taken from the land that I gave you and you will be taken into exile. And that's exactly what happened. The people continued to rebel. And then in 586 BC, they were taken away by the Babylonians from Jerusalem into exile. Jeremiah the prophet prophesied this. He says in Jeremiah 25 verse 11, this entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And just as Jeremiah predicted, they were taken into exile away from their homeland, away from the promised land for 70 years. Eventually, after that 70 years was up, just as Jeremiah prophesied, God orchestrated that they could be released and they returned to the lands, but only about 50,000 of them returned to Jerusalem. And to be honest, they felt very discouraged. There was an air of discouragement. They felt incredibly insecure because nothing was established. It was kind of all up in the air. So what was going on? Well, they were discouraged because they were a shadow of their previous size. They were a shadow of their previous prominence. Only 55,000 people, that's a lot of people. But considering they were a nation, that was tiny compared to what they'd been. Their royal city was in ruins. Jerusalem was a ruin. The temple itself, the place of worship, the central focus of God's people was a ruin. And the Davidic king was no longer on the throne. Also, they experienced threats and intimidations from the people around them. They were a very small nation now in this ruined city of Jerusalem. And all around them were other nations who were taunting them. And it says in Ezra chapter 4 verse 4, the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah to make them afraid to go on building. So they were facing intimidations and insecurities and it didn't feel good. It didn't feel landed. It didn't feel glory, glorious. Israel's future glory seemed far from certain. The only security they had was from what God had told them. God's word was, you're going to be back in the land. God's word was, the temple will be rebuilt. God had told them that he would protect them. And God had told them that an ultimate king will come. And that ultimate king was Jesus. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was down in London at a, a leaders gathering. And it was a great time. We, we were leaders from various national church movements around the UK. And at the leaders gathering, there was um, a man by the name of Mike Reeves. He's an author and he's the president of Union School of Theology. He asked me a question because he, he'd heard about our journey in Edinburgh. He'd heard about how we'd gone from being a church with uh, many buildings, a uh, multi-site church, to all of a sudden losing everything, no longer having our buildings, no longer having a bank account, no longer, you know, for a period we were unemployed as, as, as a staff team and how the church felt completely displaced. He asked, so what has God done in your heart during this time? And I thought that was a great question. So I reflected and I said, you know, I guess I realized how much I appreciated things being in place. I'm a guy who likes structure. I, you know, okay, there's a location pastor and there's a location and there's the buildings and there's our, the financial plan is there and, and everyone knows what they're doing and everything's in place. And, and, and that, I guess, I suddenly realized that gives me a sense of security. But all of a sudden, all that was up in the air. And so I said, and yet I have this huge sense of peace that God's got it, <laughs> that it's going to be okay. And I said, I think that's what's happened in my heart. I feel, I feel like, you know, I'm a broken man. I feel like I, I, I feel weak. And it feels like what I'm, a, the, the church I'm leading, it feels unstable, unsettled. It feels like it's all up in the air. And yet I believe God's got this. And you know, 
I think that's probably how the people of Israel felt. In fact, that's what it says in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20. Isaiah predicted this is exactly how the people would feel. He says, in that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them. That's the Babylonians. They will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but they will rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In other words, they've gone through so much. And as a result of what they've gone through, their reliance on God is like rock solid. And I kind of feel that's where we're at as a church. We've gone through some big things, but God, you've got this. You've got this. In fact, I would go as far to say is, if you go through things in life, and they might be tragic, and they might be terrible, and they might be even evil, but if you go through things in life that causes you to be more dependent on God now, then no regrets. Because being God dependent, being dependent on God is awesome. So in the middle of this situation, God sends them encouragement. This is what it says in Ezra chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. And it describes the people of Israel. They're back in the land. They're feeling this discouragement. And this is what God does. Now, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, and they're the two prophets we're going to be studying over these next few weeks, descendant of Edo, prophesied um, to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Zadok, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. I love that. Here we see um, the prophets. God sent these prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage the leaders. That was uh, Zerubbabel and um, Joshua, the high priest, forgot their names for a second, Zerubbabel and Joshua. These were the leaders of the Jewish people and the prophets were prophesying to them, encouraging them, come on, keep going, God's with you, rebuild. And they did. I really appreciate prophetic words, prophetic input. I, I love how God speaks and brings encouragements. Last week, I was uh, on, a, on a phone call with a guy who had contacted me completely out of the blue. Um, I, I, to be honest, I didn't know the guy. He knew of me. He'd met me before, maybe three years ago or four years ago, when I'd spoken at a leaders' event. And he was one of the leaders at the leaders' event. And, and he said, Pete, I heard you teach a number of years ago, and the teaching really impacted me. And, you know, I've, I've had you on my radar since then, because it was such a time of encouragement. And he said, we've been going through some things, and we've been really considering who should we be aligning with as a church. So they've, they've got a church elsewhere in Scotland, uh, it's, it's, it's a great church. It's, it's going well. It's been going for a number of years. And they're really praying, who should they align with? Who should they, what, what should they be part of as a church? And he, sa and he said, we've been aware of your journey in Edinburgh. And we've aware, we're aware that you've set up this thing called Go Global. And we really feel, sir, that maybe we should be working with you. Can we have this conversation? So we had a huge, long conversation about this. As we were having this conversation, my phone pinged and I got a WhatsApp message. And at the end of my conversation with this guy, I listened to the WhatsApp message. It was a voice memo from my friend who's a prophet. And he sent me this message saying, Pete, I just felt God saying, in fact, God spoke this to me and told me to send it today. He said that you've taught things over the years in the past and things that you've taught over the years will continue to bear fruit now. In fact, people will be impacted by things you taught years ago and will cause God to do a work in their lives now. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what an encouragement. I was on a phone to the guy who heard me teach from the Bible from years ago, and now he was saying he wants to connect, and as a, as a church, they might well join Go Global. Isn't that amazing how prophets encourage God's people? And I just want to encourage you folks. Some of you have been used by God to bring prophetic words to people. And some of you, in fact, you don't just prophesy. Some of you, quite frankly, are called to be prophets. And I just want to encourage you, if this is the call of God in your life, stir yourself in this, get some training in this, good training, and become someone who brings words to people. Because I tell you what, when people are building, there's nothing better than having prophetic words encouraging you as you're building. There are people out there who God wants you to bring words to, words of encouragement. How many people would have quit had it not been for a word from God at just the right time? So stir yourself up in that gift. So that's what was happening to the people of Israel as they were rebuilding, they were facing discouragements, but the prophets were coming and encouraging them to rebuild. So now that, that's the context. Now I'm going to bring you into land in Haggai chapter 1, and I've got three points to make to you, three statements. 
as we go through Haggai chapter 1. And the first statement is this, inconvenient right timing. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Zadok, eh, so, so Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. This, these people say, the time is not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Verse 9, my house which remains a ruin while each one of you is busy on your own house. So, <laughs> you see God, he's got a disagreement with the people. I mean, how often does that happen? We're in disagreement with God. And that's what, exactly what's happening here. The people are saying, eh, it's time to rebuild our own houses, not God's. God's saying, no, it's time to rebuild my house, not yours. So there's this disagreement. Was it God's timing? Absolutely, it was God's timing. In fact, let me give you an incredible passage in the scripture which shows how much it was God's timing. This is, this is found in Ezra chapter 1, and it says, In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make the proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem, in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build, rebuild and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who is in Jerusalem. And may their God be with them. <laughs> so this is totally the timing to rebuild the house of God. God's just moved the most powerful man on planet earth, the king of Persia. Just in context, Persia ruled the world at the time. And the king of Persia was the most powerful man on earth, Cyrus. God told Cyrus, I want you to get the Jewish people, the Israelites, to go back to their homelands and rebuild the temple. So, and this was in line with what God had told Jeremiah to prophesy to them as well. So this is completely the timing of God. And here's them, they're in the lands and they're not sure, you know, thinking, okay, is this really God's timing? Absolutely. You've been freed from exile in order to rebuild the house of God. And I want to say to you folks, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you trust God, if you know what it is to have your sins forgiven, you have been set free. And you've been set free. You're a child of God. You've been set free. Why? To build your own house? No. You've been set free. You've been called by God. You've been saved from your sins in order to help build the house of the Lord, the church, in this time. God's got your house covered. You've got to prioritize his house. You ever notice that God's right timing so often doesn't look like God's right timing, or it doesn't, certainly doesn't feel like God's right timing? To be honest, whenever I've felt God leading me and when I've looked at people who felt led by God, often it didn't look or feel like a good time to do what God was calling them to do and nevertheless God was calling them you look at the apostles after the death and resurrection of Jesus you know he then commissioned them okay I want you to go into all the world and make disciples change the world and the those early disciples they would be thinking no it's too soon they would have been saying Jesus please hang around for another few years we need more training we feel ill-equipped and yet God had said no no now's the time go make disciples God's timing doesn't look or feel like God's timing, and yet, nevertheless, it's God's timing. I caught myself asking, again, maybe you've done the same. Certainly on the back of what we've gone through, I caught myself honestly saying, God, you know, has the last, you know, we planted a church 20 years ago, has the last 20 years been a waste of time? Should we have realigned 20 years ago? Should we have started with a different organization? Should we have gone in a different way? You know, has the last 20 years been a waste? Or should I figure this out 10 years ago before we found ourselves in the situation we found? And I felt God say, Pete, this is exactly the right timing. You were meant to have done that journey. What happened was necessary. And where you are now is exactly where I want you to be. 
and it doesn't feel convenient it doesn't feel easy and that nevertheless we're in the bullseye of God's will I believe with all my heart that we're exactly where God wants us to be I believe with all my heart that God has called us into a new era as a church I believe with all my heart that God is saying to us as a congregation as a people of God it's time to rebuild I believe with all my heart God is saying the best is yet to come for us and for you and I believe we're on the cusp of a move of God so here's my question why were the people hesitating from rebuilding God's house what was it that was holding them back well to be honest I get it I mean and you get it as well if you look at it they were pretty insecure and they, they were thinking of their own survival um, way back in 1943 there was a psychologist called uh, Maslow and Abraham Maslow and he wrote in a paper a paper entitled a theory of human motivation and he came up with what we know as the Ma Maslow's hierarchy of need and it's often shown as a as a in a diagram as a triangle and at the base of the triangle is it shows this is a human's basic needs physiological needs we need food water warmth and shelter if we don't have that we can't think of anything else we're not thinking you know what's the purpose of life we're just thinking man i need food in my stomach i need warmth i need shelter and then once we've got that in place then we go on to our safety needs we need security we need employment and we need safety and then after we've got that in place we go on to love and belonging where we think okay now i need intimate relationships and friends and then we we get on to deeper things like your self-esteem your your sense of respect confidence and status but then there's the ultimate level, which is self-actualization. That's what Maslow calls it. And, he, and, and, and this would be spirituality, your relationship with God, sense of fulfillment and the importance of morality. And what Abraham Maslow is saying that is you can't get on to those higher levels until you've got the basic things in place. So self-preservation, that was what was going on with these people. They just, man, they just come through, they just come from exile. They just, they were literally surviving. They, they were living in a city of ruins. And they were thinking, man, we just need four walls and a roof over our head. We need 2.4 kids and a Volvo and a wimpy house. We just need basic survival here. That's what was going on. In fact, they were doing what was just natural to most human beings. And yet God was saying, no. Yeah, I get why you want to prioritize building your own house. But there's a bigger priority at stake. There's a bigger calling. Do you know, many people post-COVID have disengaged with building the house of God. Uh, research has shown and many of and, and also to be honest forget the research I've talked to pastors all over the nation and the research is saying and my friends are saying that they've seen a huge drop in the number of people involved with church after the COVID and kind of people are saying this yeah let's get church going again but I'm going to take a back seat others can step forward I'm not going to get as involved this time around I'm going to hold back my giving for this season I'm just going to focus on myself for a bit. That's the kind of thing that the people of God are saying. And yet God's saying, no, it's time to rebuild my house. A number of years ago, uh, good friends, Amon and Comfort, Dawa, they had been part of our church in Edinburgh for many years. And uh, they came to me with a dream. They, they said, Pete, we feel that God's calling us to go back to northern Nigeria and start a church in the city of Gombe. And this was a huge thing because, to be honest, in Edinburgh, they had uh, security. They, had, they were ed very well-educated people. They had a life here in Edinburgh. And yet they were feeling God was calling them back to northern Nigeria, which was a very insecure place. In fact, last month, Open Doors rated northern Nigeria as the number one place on earth in terms of the most dangerous place to live for Christians. And that's where they went back to. Anyway, let me play you... An excerpt. This is we, we sent some money from Go Global, from our church and from our organisation to be a blessing to them. And just in the last few weeks, just to help them with a building project. And in response to that, Amon sent me this voice memo. And I just want you to hear it because I want it to encourage you as someone who's totally prioritising God's house. So a few years ago, um, Comfort and I took a decision after we studied the book of Haggai. And um, we said that our house will not be more comfortable than the church. Um, we received the revelation that God is as well 
concern about his church, about the outlook of his church. And so Comfort and I decided that whatever sacrifice we are going to make towards the church, um, within our means, we will have to do it. Um, our houses will not be more comfortable than the church. And that is why in the past years, we have made huge sacrifices towards the church. Um, sometimes last year, when we discovered that the number of children was growing, and um, the teacher reported to us that they don't have a TV to show some Christian movies to the kids, um, some songs or cartoons for kids, uh, we had to take addition to sacrifice our television at home. Um, it was a television we so cherished, but for the sake of his kingdom, we had to carry the TV and the DVD, and we came to the church and sacrificed it to the children's department. And um, see what God has done for us. Um, very soon, we'll be having our own child. Uh, God is faithful. So we are comfortable making sacrifices for the church. We are not comfortable to see some needs in the church while we are comfortable. And so that is why we have um, made it a mandate that until the church becomes comfortable, we will not be comfortable. And that's the reason why we are making every sacrifice towards the church. And um, it's, it's a pledge we are holding on and we will keep doing it until the church stabilizes until the children's department stabilizes and until the church stabilizes. Keep praying for us, Pastor Pete. Thank you very much for your immense support. May the Lord increase you. So such a powerful, powerful statement by our, our dear friends, Amon and Comfort, who are living a very sacrificial life there in Gombe in order to prioritize God's house. And I, I, I'm, I'm letting you hear that, not to kind of make you feel guilty, but just to inspire you. I mean, to say, wow, look at that. And God wants us to capture that heart. Why would you want to serve in the church? Why would you want to give the church everything? Well, because you are called. It says in Ephesians 2.10, we are his handiwork. You are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us, for you to do. It's totally what you're called to do. Why should you serve and help rebuild God's house? Well, because there's a mega story. There's a bigger story. We're very zoomed in. We're very stuck in our, in our now. But there's a bigger story. God is doing something in our generation. God is doing something in our nation. We get to be part of that bigger story. Why would you want to help rebuild the house of God? Well, I think it, and I believe this with all my heart, and this links to the, the next thing I want to say, is it unlocks blessing in your life. And this is the second thing I want to say. You can't outgive God. Let's continue in Haggai 1, this time from verse 5 onwards. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you do not have your fill. You put on clothes, but they are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You've expected much, but see, it has turned out to be little. What you've brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens are withheld their due and the earth its crops. Wow, so strong. Do you know, I remember when the church was started way back 1998, I think it was the first or the second message. We were in our living room at the time. There was only maybe five or six people coming along. That was how the church was, me, Angie, and a few other people. And I remember it was, it was the first week or the second week, I can't remember which one. I remember sharing a message and the message that I shared with the group of people in my living room was this. The title was, you build God's house, he'll build your house. 
And it was from that moment in, 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 in 2 Samuel where God's got, David's got it in his heart. I want to rebuild the house of God. 2 Samuel chapter 7. I want to rebuild the house. I want to build the house of God. And Nathan the prophet says to David, no, no, God's going to build you a house. And, and the message I shared with the small group in my house was, if you build God's house, he'll build yours. And you know, I, I want to say it to you. If you build God's house, he'll look after your house. And I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. I mean, listen, listen to, this is the apostle Peter interacting with Jesus. And he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 20 onwards, then, then Peter spoke up and said, we've left everything to follow you, Jesus. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who's left brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus is saying, yeah, I get you've given up things to follow me. You've given up things to follow me and pursue my purpose. But you need to know, if you've given up things for me, I can assure you, you're going to get back so much more. <laughs> you're going to get so much more back. With persecutions, in other words, following Jesus ain't always going to be the easy option. It's the best option. It's the blessed option. But it won't be the easy option. And in the future, eternal life. But you're going to be blessed. And Jesus said it in another place in Matthew 6, verse 33. He said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, and in the context, he's saying, you know, your things you need for life, your provision, your clothes, your food, your houses, etc., etc. All these things will be given to you as well. You seek first God's kingdom. You build his house. He's going to build your house. I think, I think what God's saying is, you know, that Maslow hierarchy of need. I think he's, God's saying, flip it, <laughs> okay? So instead of prioritizing your basic needs, I need food and shelter and warmth and security and a job and all those, those things which are legitimate needs, human needs. God's saying, flip it. Go to the most important thing. Get the walk with God right. Get your priorities with God right. You get that right. And then everything else, everything else in that Maslow hierarchy, it will all change from there on up that God will provide everything that you need. And I have to say, Angie and I shared that in our house when we just started the church. And we, we gave so much of our time, of our money, of our energies, so much. And yet our testimony has been that God has so provided for us beyond our own means to provide for ourselves. And I want that to be your testimony as well. And hey, I wanna to say to any of you today joining, and you're not, maybe you're not yet following Jesus, and, and here you've, you've just heard a, a ra radical call to following Jesus. Peter the Apostle said, listen, we've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. Why don't you do the same? I mean, that's such a big step. Choose to follow Jesus. Leave your old life. Leave a life of sin. Choose to follow Jesus. Repent for your sin. Get baptized. Follow Jesus. Plug into church. Make a difference with your life. You only live once. Jesus gave everything for you on a cross 2,000 years ago so you could be forgiven for your sins. Why not give your everything to him? Trust him today. So that's the point number two. And then here's the final point, and it's this. Repentance unlocks power. Haggai 1 verse 12 to 15. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, that's the, the ruler, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, that's the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to his people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Jehoshua, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. And they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. So here's the people of God. They've heard the challenge. Stop building your own house. Stop pr pr wrongly prioritizing your priorities. Instead, prioritize God's priorities, his house. Today, for us, it's not a temple in Jerusalem, it's the church. 
they heard the challenge and they said, okay. They realized they'd been prioritizing their comfort over God's interests. And they said, okay, God, we repent. They feared God. They sensed God was in this message. And I hope you sense God is in this message to you. And they stopped prioritizing their comforts over God's house. And I, I, the challenge from God, I believe, for us, for me, for you, is this. Let's stop prioritizing ourselves and our own comforts and our own interests over God's plan, God's house, the church, God's purposes. He has a plan and he's calling us as people to be re-engaged with that plan. So let's do that. Let's repent. Probably they still felt challenged. They probably still felt insecure, but they were realigned with the purposes of God. So even in your weakness, even though you still feel the challenge, even though you feel like everything's still up in the air, even in your weakness, make a choice to align with the purpose of God. Because as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Notice when they repented, notice when they got themselves in line with what God's purpose was, when they said, God, we've been, we've been prioritizing the wrong things, we're gonna get back on track and prioritize the things that you prioritize. When they made that decision, notice, God stirred them up. God gave them power to do the work. Power follows repentance, so repent. Come on, let's turn, let's turn back to God, let's get back on track with his purpose. And as we do, God's power will come right up behind us. Listen, the people in this generation had a testimony of God doing a work through them. And in our generation, we will have a testimony of what the Lord did with the broken people, with the people who didn't have it all together, with the people who maybe felt weak in themselves. But God did a work, and that will be our testimony. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the challenge of the prophet Haggai. God, it came to an ancient people at a time of discouragement, at a time of rebuilding, and it came with a punch, and it came with a strength, and the people heard the message, and the people reprioritized the house of God. And here we are in our generation, and the word of God, scripture, the Bible, speaks so relevantly, as if the prophet was speaking to us directly, speaks to us today, calling us to rebuild the house of the Lord in our generation. And we also repent. We also say, yes, God. We reprioritize the house of God. And just where you are, as we're praying, you pray your own decision just now. Come on, let's make a clear decision before God to reprioritize the house of the Lord. Let's get back on track. Let's reprioritize his house. Pray that prayer. As we're praying, I want to give you an opportunity today. Maybe you're connecting and you haven't yet got a relationship with God himself. So chuffed you've been listening in. And the challenge for you, in God's love, he called you to prioritize him. You thought life was about you. It's not. Life's about him. And when you make life about him, the one who gets blessed is you. It's the best thing you can do for yourself is to not prioritize yourself, but prioritize him. Jesus gave everything for you. He died and rose again to save you from your sins. Today, put your faith in him. Turn from your sins. Become a follower of Jesus. If that's you, then this is your moment. Pray this prayer with me just one line at a time. Say, dear Lord God, I thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place and rising again. Thank you you're alive right now. Today, I put you first in my life. I choose to become a follower of Jesus. God, thanks for dying so I could be forgiven. And I ask you today to forgive my sins and give me a new start. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Jesus, be Lord of my life from now on. Amen. As you've prayed that prayer, I know that God has heard you and he saves you. We would love to hear from you. If you're on the platform, please click the button saying I prayed that prayer or if you're on Facebook or um, YouTube or listen to the podcast in retrospect please email us to let us know you've made that decision because we want to do everything we can to support you as you make this strong journey forward into your future of reprioritizing God 
great to be with you. We're now going to worship God. He is the Lord.
Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Pastor Peter, for that important message. You know, prioritizing the house of God is so, so important in this next season. Please put first things first. A couple of things to let you know about uh, our in-person services happening as usual at 2 p.m. in Central. We'd love to see you there, especially if you haven't been before, please come along. Uh, if you're not local to Edinburgh, we look forward to connecting with you next week on Church Online again. Also, after the in-person service this afternoon, we have an event called This Is Our Church. So if you're new to the church, wondering who are these people, what's their vision, and you'd like to meet the pastor, like to meet some others who are in the same boat, we'd love to see you at This Is Our Church just after the in-person service this afternoon. We'd love to see you there. Yeah, thank you, Graham. So also, if you'd like to give, just to let you know, our platform is open for you to give generously as your heart desires so the link is going to be somewhere on the screen and we'd also like to say thank you so much to those who have been religiously giving to the church you are not taken for granted and it's your generosity that has actually brought us this far so thank you once again and with that it's bye bye yeah that's us done for <laughs> this week so we'd love to see you connect again next week take care god bless and see you soon Bye bye. bye My face is frozen. Yeah, my face is frozen. I can't feel my face. Okay. So I'd say enjoy, guys. Enjoy. 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 Ah, <laughs> oh, thank you. Ooh, thank I'm you. Actually, that was actually, great. That was so My great. knees are knocking, man. I'm so cold. <laughs> my toes. Well, thank you so much, worship team, and also. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just a couple of announcements. Something exciting has been happening with the church and we're so happy about it. Last week, we learnt that we are finally a registered charity. Woo! I have a happy dance. I have a happy dance. I, have, I don't dance, that is. <laughs> 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 I guess we're going to have to do that again. I guess we're going to have to do that again.